Download our new One Islam TV app and watch from a selection of thousands of videos with no ads. You can even watch our content offline. Download now from these platforms or visit www.oneislam.tv. In today's discussion, we're going to clarify the exact opposite of Tawheed, which is Shirk. Now, some of you might ask, well, how come we're studying Shirk, which is so dangerous and evil? The response to that is that it is one of the fundamental principles of Islam that the Muslim study evil to be aware of it, to know it, to avoid it. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-An'am, verse 55, that وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ This is how we clarify the signs. وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And so that the path of the sinners might be made clear. So Allah makes His path, the Surat Al-Mustaqim, clear. And He also makes the path of the sinners clear. Why? To avoid it. Likewise, one of the companions by the name of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, he said, the companions would ask the Prophet wasallam about good. And I would ask about evil. Why? Because I was scared I might fall into it. I was scared I might fall into it. And one of the Arab poets, he said, learn evil, not for the sake of evil, but to avoid it. He who does not learn evil will eventually fall into it. So it is one of the fundamental principles of Islam that we study. After we study the basics of good that we're supposed to know, we also study and understand what is evil and prohibited. Not to commit it, not to do it, but to recognize it, be aware of it, and therefore, based on that awareness and recognition, avoid it to the best extent possible. So we study shirk because it is so evil and dangerous. A person who commits shirk, his actions will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawheed must be perfected in order for actions to be accepted. Only by knowing shirk will we, will we be able to tell whether it is in us or not, and therefore know, inshallah, if our actions are accepted to Allah or not. Likewise, the only way that a person will save himself from the fire of hell is by avoiding shirk and dying upon Tawheed. If he is not even aware of shirk, how can he avoid it? If he doesn't even know what qualifies as shirk, what are the signs of shirk, what are the characteristics of shirk, what are the types of shirk, then how will he be able to avoid it? Another point that drives home the emphasis of studying this concept of shirk is that only when a person realizes how dangerous shirk is, will he want to study it. When you realize how dangerous a concept is, for example, Scientists, biologists, doctors, they spend their entire lives studying dangerous diseases. Why? Because they want to avoid it. They want to try to find cures for it, make sure it doesn't happen. So only when a person realizes how dangerous shirk is, how evil it is, this will give him the incentive to learn more about shirk in order to avoid it. Shirk is of many types, many categories. Once again, only through a study of shirk. Only by knowing these categories in detail will a person be able to say, insha'Allah, that he has avoided shirk and save himself from the fire of hell. So what exactly is shirk? What exactly is shirk? How do we define shirk? The best definitions of anything always found in the Quran and Sunnah. And in this episode of ours, and in all our episodes, we always take you back to the sources. We take you back to the Quran and Sunnah. You're not going to hear my opinion or the opinion of anyone else. We're going to take you back to the statements of Allah and the statements of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So shirk has been defined in the Quran and in the Sunnah. As for the Quran, Surah Baqarah verse 22. As for the Sunnah, if you can hand me volume 8 of Bukhari. Surah Baqarah verse 22, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that Allah is the one who has spread out the earth for you and made the sky a ceiling. Jazakallah khair. And sent down rain from the skies to give you provision, so do not make with Allah partners. This is shirk. Do not make with Allah partners while you know that He is one. Making partners with Allah, this is the meaning of shirk. Likewise in Sahih al-Bukhari, hadith number 4,477, we find that the Prophet Sallallahu was asked, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, what is the greatest sin in the sight of Allah? He said, to make partners along with Allah even though He is the one who created you. Again, He defined shirk, to make partners along with Allah. 
Then he was asked, what is next? He said that you kill your child for fear that he will eat your food. Then he said, what is next? He said to have illicit relationships with your neighbor's wife. But the first thing he said was that you make partners with Allah. And this is how he defined shirk. And this is how the Quran defines shirk as well. Such a partner can exist if you attribute powers to certain beings that only Allah is worthy of. Such a partner can exist when you give the acts of devotion, acts of worship that are due only to Allah. In other words, in other words, the proper definition for shirk can also be said to be to give the rights of Allah to the created. This is what shirk is. Something that is due to Allah, you give it to a created being. Some name, some attribute, some act of worship, whatever it is. If it is due to Allah and only Allah is worthy of it, then if and when you give it to other than Allah, you have committed an act of shirk. This is why or this is how you have made a partner along with Allah. You have made a partner along with Allah by giving something that is the sole right of Allah, that only Allah is worthy of, you have given it to someone else. This is the definition of shirk. What are some of the dangers of shirk? Well, the dangers of shirk are very many. <clears throat> Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran twice, Surah Nisa, verse 48 and verse 116. Allah will never forgive that shirk be done with him. And he will forgive anything less than shirk. Showing you shirk is the greatest sin. Anything below shirk, Allah might forgive it if he wants to. If he wishes, he will forgive any sin below shirk. But the sin of shirk, if a person dies committing shirk, believing in shirk, acting upon shirk, that person will never, ever be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is because Allah clearly says so twice. And without a doubt, this shows you the evil nature of shirk, where it is the one and only unforgivable sin in the sight of Allah. Another evil manifestation and problem with shirk is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran, in Surah Zumar verse 65, that when a person commits shirk, all of his good deeds will be destroyed. Every single one of his good deeds. Imagine this, one act of shirk, one act will nullify, cancel, abrogate, reskind every single good that you've done in your life, unless and until you repent from that shirk. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Zumar verse 65, that indeed it has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and to the prophets before you, that whoever commits shirk with Allah, whoever associates partners with Allah, that his work would surely become worthless. All of his good deeds will be in vain and he will be in the hereafter amongst the losers. Ponder over this verse. Firstly, it is addressed to the Prophet ﷺ himself, showing you its severity. That even if you were to do this, this would happen. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this same message was revealed to the Prophets before you. It was revealed to you and to the Prophets before you. So this is not something new. It's not something invented in this religion. No. This is, has been the theme since the creation of Adam alayhi salam. Tawheed is why we are here and shirk is what we must avoid. Whoever commits shirk, all of his good deeds will be in vain. Another point in this verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu and says if you were to do shirk, and this is of course impossible, but theoretically, hypothetically, if you were to do shirk, then you, O Muhammad sallallahu the greatest human being and the one who has done the most good, even your good, all of it would be nullified. So how much more so when the average Muslim whose good deeds will not even compare to the good deeds of the Prophet sallallahu how much more so if he does shirk? Lastly, Allah concludes this verse by stating that whoever commits shirk will be amongst the losers, amongst those who are punished in the hereafter. So this one verse, Surah Zumar verse 65, in and of itself shows you the dangers and the evils of shirk. Another evil of shirk is that if a person dies while committing shirk, having committed shirk, having not repented from committing shirk, another danger of shirk is that when a person dies committing shirk, then it is prohibited. It is haram for the Muslims to seek forgiveness for him. You cannot even ask Allah to forgive someone who worships an idol or worships other than him. You cannot even ask Allah to forgive him. It is so evil, so repugnant, so dirty that Allah has commanded you in the Quran, do not seek forgiveness for those who have committed shirk and died in their shirk. Allah says, Surah Tawbah, verse 113, 
it is not befitting for the Prophet ﷺ himself and those who believe to ask forgiveness for those who commit shirk. Even the Prophet of Allah, the one who was sent to be a mercy to mankind, so evil as shirk, so disgusting as shirk, so repugnant and vile as shirk, that even the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prohibited from asking Allah to forgive those who commit shirk. And Allah says, even if they are relatives. In this ayah, look it up, ya ikhwa, look it up, brothers and sisters. Don't take my word for it. Go back to the sources. Surah Tawbah, verse 113. Allah says, it is not for the Prophet and those who believe to ask forgiveness for the people who commit shirk, even if they are relatives. After it has been made clear to them that they, the people who commit shirk, are going to go to the fire of hell. Can something be more disgusting than this? That when a person dies, you cannot ask the Rahman, the Rahim, the ever merciful, the beneficent. You cannot even ask him, even if he's your father or mother or brother or sister or son or daughter. If he died as a non-Muslim having practiced shirk, you cannot ask Allah to forgive these people. How evil must shirk be and how dirty. Prophet Wasallam over and over again described the dangers of shirk. In one hadith he said, never commit shirk with Allah, even if you are cut into pieces and burnt to death. Don't commit shirk with Allah. Even if people are try to cut you into pieces, try to burn you to death, do not associate partners with Allah. In another hadith, he said, nine are the major sins. The greatest one of them is to commit shirk with Allah. The greatest sin. And of course it is the greatest sin because it, because it is the only unforgivable sin. The only sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, He will never forgive to the one who dies practicing it. This is an important point. Now someone will say, well, uh, I wasn't a Muslim and I accepted Islam. While I was not a Muslim, I committed shirk. Yes, of course, when you commit shirk and then accept Tawheed, reject your shirk and you die in the state of Tawheed, this is what counts. We are talking about the one who commits shirk until he dies. He believes it is all right to commit shirk. He practices shirk until his death. Obviously, if someone accepts Islam, most of the Sahaba, most of the companions, they were idol worshippers before Islam came. When they accepted Islam, they became the best of the creation. So the point is, those who commit shirk and die in the state of shirk, these are the problems that, associate, or that are associated with them. Obviously, when re one repents, when one leaves his shirk, when one turns to Allah, when one accepts la ilaha illallah, in this case, the shirk also is forgiven. There is another important point which is necessary to talk about. And that is that shirk is a deviation from the natural state of man. Tawheed is the natural state of man. Believing in one God and worshipping Him alone, this is a natural state of man. Shirk crept into mankind afterwards. In other words, Tawheed existed before Shirk. Tawheed existed before Shirk. First, mankind used to worship Allah and nothing else. And then Shirk came and crept into society. This is our belief. The modern researchers of our times the anthropologists, they have the exact opposite belief. They claim that polytheism, worshipping many gods, was the initial state of man. And then they evolved into monotheism, one god. We claim, no, this is not true. It is not true at all. Initially, mankind worshipped Allah alone. There was no shirk. And then shirk crept in afterwards. How do we prove this? Well, there's three simple proofs. The first proof which we discussed uh, in an earlier episode, is the proof of the covenant that Allah took with mankind. Remember this covenant, we took it before. That Allah created Adam, and from Adam He extracted the loins. From the loins of Adam He extracted all of the children of Adam. And He spread them forth in front of Him. And He spoke to them face to face and He said, Am I not your Lord? They said, Yes. We, all of us were there. All of us were there at that time. We said, Yes, you are our Lord. So. The fact that Allah is our Lord and Allah is one is ingrained in us. And we call this the fitra. We call this the human nature, innate human nature. The mithaq is the covenant, that's the actual covenant. We don't remember the covenant. None of us remembers this because Allah removed this from our memory. But He left some remnants of this covenant. He left the remnants of this covenant in our soul. And this is what we call the fitra. So the fitra is the remnant, the byproduct if you like of the covenant, the mithaq. 
And this fitrah, every one of us, Muslim or non-Muslim, has it. Like the Prophet Sallallahu said, every child is born upon the fitrah. Meaning, if that child were left to his own, without the outside interference of culture and society and parents, he would grow up knowing that there is a God and that that God is one and that he is worthy of worship. This is the fitrah. And that is why, because of the fitrah, my dear brothers and sisters, this is why you find so many people accepting Islam. When they hear the Qur'an, when they hear the Sunnah, when they hear La ilaha illallah, it clicks. It clicks because this is a part of their soul. They want to believe in a perfect God. They want to believe that only He is worthy of worship. But they've never heard it before because of their society and culture. So their fitrah is there. And that is why Islam is the fastest growing. It will always be the fastest growing religion on the face of this earth. Because Islam clicks with the fitrah. It is the fitrah. Islam is the fitrah. When people hear about Islam, automatically they're attracted to it because it fits in with their way of life, with their way of thinking. It fits in with the innate nature that they have. Go to any person who converted to Islam and ask him this, and he will acknowledge this, that when he heard about Islam, when he heard about Tawheed, it made complete sense to him. It just felt right. And this is what the fitrah is. Another proof that Tawheed existed before shirk, and that is that we know that the first shirk crept in at the time of Nuh alayhi salam, before Nuh. When the people of Nuh started worshipping idols, pious people, the icons of pious people were transformed into idols. Like the Prophet sallallahu said, between Adam and Nuh were ten generations upon Tawheed. Ten generations were upon the pure religion of Islam. Then these people came, Wad and Suwa and Yaghuth and Ya'uq and Nasr, which are mentioned in Surah Nuh. And they were pious people worshipping Allah upon Tawheed. And they died and the people built images of them and they started worshipping them. So this proves that before these people, mankind was upon Tawheed. Before these people came, mankind was upon Tawheed. And this is mentioned explicitly in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah verse 213, Allah says, كَانَ ummatan wahida." All of mankind was one nation. One nation. When you go back and you look up what the scholars of Tafsir have to say about this, they say, meaning they were one nation in their worship of Allah. That you, all of them used to worship Allah. Mankind initially was all upon Tawheed and they used to worship Allah Azza Then differences happened and shirk crept in and different religions and different cults and different groups were formed. This is yet another proof that Tawheed existed before shirk. A third proof is that, well, this is a very common sense proof. Who was the first man on the face of this earth? Adam. Was Adam a prophet? Well, let's look it up. If you can give me Sahih ibn Hibban, volume number 14. The first person whom Allah created was whom? Adam. And Adam, was he a prophet or not? Yes, he was a prophet. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ himself said. He was the first prophet. Remember Sahih ibn Hibban, the author intended to compile all the authentic ahadith uh, that he could find. However, his conditions were not as strict and as exact as those of Bukhari and Muslim. And also the author arranged this book in a very difficult manner because he was influ uh, he was he, 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 he arranged it such that all the commandments were in one, all the prohibitions were in another, another chapter, all the stories were in another chapter. So because of this, people couldn't benefit from it until another scholar came in the 8th century Hijrah by the name of Ibn Biliban and he edited it. He arranged it, rearranged it, such that people could find the chapter they wanted and look it up. So when you buy it today, you actually buy the edited version, which is rearranged in order to facilitate finding the hadith you need. If you turn to hadith 6189, 6, you find that the Prophet ﷺ was asked, a person asked, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, was Adam a prophet? Was Adam a prophet? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes. And he was one whom Allah spoke to directly. Yes, and he was one whom Allah spoke to directly. So this is a very simple proof that initially mankind was upon Tawheed because the first man was Adam and Adam was a prophet and the prophets called to Tawheed. Now a question arises, who was Adam sent to? There was no mankind, right? He was sent to his own children. He was sent to his own children. His own children were the people that accepted his message and none of them committed shirk. Neither his grandchildren nor great-great-grandchildren until 10 generations came. And then after that, Nuh came and that was when the shirk started before the time of Nuh. 
Okay, so these are three simple evidences that Tawheed existed before shirk. The first evidence is the evidence of the, the, the covenant and the human nature, innate nature, the, the mithaq and the fitra, which shows you that we are innately, intuitively, we are guided to Tawheed. The second proof is the fact that the first shirk started at the time of Nuh, which means that before the time of Nuh, there was no shirk. And the third proof is very simple proof is that the first man to be created was Adam and Adam was a prophet and the prophets do not commit shirk. So to conclude, we state that shirk means giving the rights of Allah to other than Allah, whatever that right might be. Whatever is due to Allah must be directed to Allah. If we direct it to other than Allah, then we have committed the sin of shirk. And the sin of shirk is a sin that is not forgivable in the sight of Allah. And it is the one sin that Allah has promised if a person dies while in a state of shirk, he will never be forgiven. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves us from all types of shirk, the small of it and the large of it, the minor of it and the major of it. And He makes us live and die upon Tawheed. With this, we come to the conclusion of today's episode. We hope to see you next time. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. With One for Kids TV, your little ones will enjoy lots of animated series, catchy songs, and engaging stories, all designed to teach them the beauty of Islam in an enjoyable and fun way. Our content will inspire and entertain your children while increasing their love for Allah and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Download the One for Kids TV app now from the Apple, Google, and Amazon stores today. Mm -hmm.